Science is going beyond the rainbow, beyond the visible, beyond the obvious. Doing science also has a joy of its own. The joy of seeing patterns, of finding harmony in nature. But at the same time, science is also a very effective instrument to transform the society as Pandit Nehru had envisioned. Science contributed tremendously to the well-being of the society. But the fact remains that common man's feeling for science ranges from a blind reverence to that of fear. Isaac Asimov has cautioned against the perils of a public ignorant of science. Public lectures on science, interpreting science to public, therefore assume great significance. Faraday's initiation into serious science being a consequence of Davies public lectures at the Royal Institution is a part of folklore by now. Talking about science is best not left to the ignoramuses. It's best to hear about science, its scope from those who have experienced the joy and ecstasy of discovering. University of Lucknow celebrated its 85th anniversary in the year 2006 and to mark the occasion, it was decided to hold public lectures by three eminent scientists. Professor C. N. R. Rao, Honorary President and Linus Pauling Professor at Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore. Dr. Raghunath A. Mashilkar, Director General, CSIR. And a well-known material scientist, Professor M. Vijayan from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. These lectures, held at Malviya Hall of the University of Lucknow on 12th and 16th of February, were inaugurated by His Excellency, Governor of Uttar Pradesh, Shri T. Rajeshwar, on 12th of February. I welcome you to this present The guests were welcomed by Professor R. P. Singh, a material scientist of international repute and Vice Chancellor of the University of Lucknow. Light symbolizes knowledge. May I request our honorable guests to kindly light the lamp. For mediates in this world, science forms the basis of comfortable living. For many, science is a vocation. There are some others who also live off it. But for some, very few, science is a way of life. Dr. Ragnar A. Mashilkar is among those few. He is a leading chemical technologist. Technology is commonly associated with huge factories, high-rise buildings, a fancy lifestyle or gadgets, the plumes, the glamour it lends to dull and drab homo sapiens. Not for R. M. Ashirka, a chemical technologist of international repute, Director General of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and President of INSA, for whom technology must have heart, a human face to it. Natural for a person who, even as a child, saw the rough side of life, appreciated the value of empowerment. A person who later as an adult got to understand how important it is to get a canvas to paint and show the true caliber. A person who remains humble, down to earth and remembers Mahatma Gandhi's dictum of keeping the poorest of the poor in mind whenever taking up any task. Dr. Mashilkar, born in Goa on 1st of January 1943, lost his father when he was just six. He was brought up by his mother, Srimati Anjana Thai. He came up the life a difficult way, but excelled in studies. The young student Raghunath was inspired by his principal, Mr. Bhave, who had demonstrated to him the power of focusing by concentrating sunlight using a convex lens. Yes, a lot of students watched it, but young Raghunath understood remembered and followed too. Trust 
was placed in him to shoulder responsibilities and he proved himself worthy of them time and again after his outstandingly meritorious career in school he obtained a graduate degree and doctoral degree in chemical technology from bombay university and then worked in uk before returning to india when invited some outstanding achievements in the laboratory and thereafter he headed the national chemical laboratory pune and then was selected to head the prestigious council for scientific and industrial research in 1995 dr mashelkar belongs to the highest quality bracket he is also the president of indian national science academy and materials research society of india he has been conferred with many awards and honors including padma shri and padma bhushan and ss bhatnagar award lifetime achievement award by indian science congress association ashutosh mukherjee award by the same and the stars of asia award also named among the 50 path breakers of post independence india by business week in 1997 he was the first scientist recipient of jrd tata corporate leadership award in 1998 He has been bestowed with fellowships of many national and international academies including the Royal Society and the US Academy of Sciences. But even trying to judge him on the basis of these coveted 50 awards and many fellowships, 20 honorary doctorates, about 240 research papers, over 20 books or 28 patents and the memberships of many international committees alone would be unfair. Dr Mashelkar is also responsible for bringing about a change in culture of research and attuning science and technology to changing times and give a human face to technology especially at CSIR Dr Mashelkar chose to speak on making technology work for the poor a theme close to his heart I'm going to touch upon a subject which deals with uh, the poor and particularly making high technology work for the poor why have i chosen this subject next if you see there are huge asymmetries in the world today we have 1.2 billion people who live on less than dollar 1 per day and majority of them are in india we have 120 million children not in the primary school and majority of them in india there are 800 million people will go to bed hungry tonight and majority of them in india now for such poor people what is it that high technology can do that is the subject of my talk if you look at what are the concerns of the poor what are they first is poverty illiteracy there is an issue of access to education health care water energy connectivity and so many others people are poor because they are illiterate and they are illiterate because they are poor next what do we need to do in order to tackle these problems of course we require technological innovations which will be based on good science but you also require social innovations along with that you require policy level innovations by the government and mere technological innovations in the absence of uh, Uh, social or policy level innovations will not work next if you look at social innovations you find that there are wonderful examples in india where difference has been made like what mb foundation has done or what pratham has done what ekal vidyalaya has done pratham for example has been able to get millions of children from villages from slums into the school by adopting some extraordinarily innovative methods next if you look at water the famous example of tarun bharat sang is with us next if you look at income generating capabilities you look at the examples of velugu kadambashri mahila bank i had the pleasure of hearing kadambashri uh, presentation uh, in the marico innovation foundation about couple of months ago and the innovation they have done to lift the people out of their poverty really incredible issue is scaling it up and scaling it up with speed next and you find that in governance there have been many innovations look at lok satta for example the political reform 
Surat, the city reform, a city after plague was considered to be one of the worst in the world, one of the dirtiest in the world, became one of the most beautiful uh, in the world. Within 18 months, driven by one Rao, a civil servant, who energized the entire city of Surat through some very, very interesting innovations. Trichy, for example, the police, trans uh, police transformation. Next. But what we also require are policy level innovations on part of the government. Let me just give you two illustrations to explain what I mean. Next. If you remember, Henry Ford had said, let the customer have any color of the car as long as it is black. You remember that. No choice. The Indian government in the pre-1991 era had done the same thing. They didn't give us the choice. They also said, let the customer have any car as long as it is ambassador or fiat. You remember that. In fact, there was another variety also called standard, by the way. It became uh, extinct. However, it was in 1991 when we li liberated ourselves from those shackles, opened up to the rest of the world, competition came in. Then Ratan Tata was allowed to innovate. 1993 was allowed to make a car and what came out was this Indica. In fact, Jayadi Tata in February 1978 had said, if Telco had been allowed to develop as it should have been, I have no doubt we would be making cars in India. And the Tata car would have been dominant, as dominant as the Tata truck is today, but he was not allowed to. It was only in 1993, and when this was done, what was the difference that happened? In fact, he picked up 700 engineers who had never done car design in their life, and out came Indica, a world class car. And what is the impact that we have today? In 50 years, the wheel has turned the full circle. If you go to the next slide, you'll find that uh, in 50s, it was British Morris Oxford, which was running as Indian ambassador on Indian roads. 50 years later, it is Indian Indica, which is running as city rover on London roads. Something that we should be very, very proud of. <laughs> now, those 700 engineers, ladies and gentlemen, they always existed in Telco. But they were never allowed this particular opportunity because the government policies were so restrictive. And the fundamental point, therefore, I want to make is that in order to create that competition, which uh, Professor C.N.R. Rao rightly uh, kept on pointing out, we need to create an ecosystem, you need to create an environment in which that innovation will flourish. Now look at the impact of this. The impact of this is that Radhan Tata is looking beyond it. And there was something he personally told me which touched his heart. Next. He saw this particular scene one day. It was raining and uh, he told me that there was a family of three or four with an infant who were going on this scooter. And he said, can I not create a car, a people's car, one lakh car for them? All right. Now one lakh car looks an impossibility, but it is possible if you do innovation. And what does that innovation mean? Next. That innovation first has to be technical. I mean using plastics, very low cost assembly operations, not using welding, but using very high performance adhesives. Next. But it also requires innovations in terms of delivering it. Assembly come retail operations which are combined to provide low cost service for cars, small satellite units where cars are assembled, sold and serviced, local entrepreneurs to invest in units, replace the dealer and his margins, whole range of things. So it is an issue of a total innovation, technological as well as the way you put a car in the hands of a customer. All right? It's a total innovation chain. And I just happened to meet him about two to three weeks ago and he seems well on course. I had been there six months ago. I saw they were still in the midst of the design and creating a prototype, but they seem to be uh, sort of on. Now you can see this chain. The chain is that when the government just did not allow you to make any car at all, nobody made one. But the moment one was allowed to, gradually it has cascaded into creating what you might like to call as a people's car. How successful it will be, market will tell us. But at least there was somebody with a heart in the right place who thought of that. Next. You look at uh, the telecom policy initiatives. I remember coming back in 1976 waiting for a telephone for six years. 
seven years. All right, and I understand that just last month, five million mobiles have been sold in one month alone. How did that happen? Again, policy initiatives. In late 90s, BSNL was privatized, BSNL was corporatized, TRI was created to set up the competition policy, private sector competition was triggered. To an extent, if you remember when Reliance came in, the advertisement said that there will be a facility to make a call at the price of a postcard, if you remember, which looked like a dream at that point in time, and today we talk about 50 paisa per minute. It has all happened. And what are the effect? The consumer prices collapsed. Telecom today is a major uh, force which is powering Indian economic growth today. And there is an unintended consequence of what was done by the government. Next. Which is this. Initially, when this opening up was done, it was to bring the uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, price of a call in the city. This fellow was not supposed to benefit from that. But the way it has reached villages now. In fact, some children met me recently, and I'm going to come to their innovation a little later. And they told me they had gone to the villages, and people say that any farmer who has uh, a motorbike uh, has a mobile. And in fact, the kind of number of mobiles that are spreading in villages is absolutely unbelievable. So what is the lesson? The lesson is innovative policy initiatives can give access of high technology to the poor, otherwise this technology would have been denied. Next. And therefore, we have to look at technological innovations, social innovations, and policy level innovations together and not in isolation. Now let me just focus on the technological innovation. You please turn only when I sort of give a signal, okay? Yeah. What are the technological innovations? Uh, first of all, if these uh, are um, uh, going to be important in making a transformation, first of all, they must be available. There will be diseases of the poor for which there may be no therapeutic at all, actually. All right? So first of all, somebody has to create it. Second, they must be affordable. There's no use if a single tablet is going to cost you $50. Third, they must be accessible. You may be in a remote village, for example, and you will not have the benefit of that particular technology. And third, they must be appropriate. Appropriate to the local conditions, otherwise they are not going to work. Next. Now, many times, Technologies are available, but not available to the poor. For example, electricity. Well, several hundreds of years ago, we had electricity, but two billion people don't have. Or safe water, for example, one billion people don't have. I mean, we do have the technology. Or adequate sanitation, two billion people don't have. Next. Now, if you look at the concerns of the poor, and let me take you through some examples. Let us look at this poverty and illiteracy issue. And as I said, People are poor because they are illiterate, and they are illiterate because they are poor. What is our problem? Next. In India, you find that there are 200 million illiterates. 70 million male, 130 million female. You can have all the talk about uh, developed India by 2020. You will not make it. You will not make it if this illiteracy doesn't go. Now, illiteracy is reducing only at around 1.3% per annum. So how many years will it take us? It will take us about 20 years to clear the backlog. Issue is, can we do it in five years or less? Through our technological innovation, let us say. Unbelievably, the answer is yes. Next. We have to follow another methodology because we have constraints. Because if you look at the current method of removing illiteracy, it takes 200 hours of instructions. So therefore, there are high dropouts. And there are 600,000 trained teachers for 600,000 villages. Where are you going to get them from? And therefore, the only course is doing things differently. Next. And innovation is all about not only doing different things, but doing them differently. Next. And that is what Kohli is trying to do, TCS. Computer-based functional literacy is what he has developed. Based on the theories of cognition, language, and communication, he has created a particular method. This emphasizes on learning words rather than alphabets, and the method focuses on reading. Next. 
And you can see, for example, load the learner with a nursing baby. By this technique, five states in five languages, 40,000 people have been already made literate. It takes just six to eight weeks. Next. Just see the empowerment. I want you to focus on this. When these women become literate, for example, entire Medak district was made literate. Look at what this lady is saying. She says, we have to sign when we accept money. Sometimes we are asked to sign on a blank paper. Now I read before I commit anything. I can even read movie titles on TV. See the kind of uh, empowerment that that woman is feeling. But what is important is what this lady is saying. She is saying, I did not know how to help my children in their studies. I had to seek help in getting directions to get about. Now I check the reports and refuse to sign on them if they are not doing well. It's so wonderful. Because that is why people keep on saying that if you empower a woman in a house, you empower, em, empower the family. She is empowering the children by becoming lit, uh, uh, sort of literate. Next. Now you can see that there is a record. About 400,000, uh, uh, 40,000 persons have been made literate. Cost is just rupees 100 per person because it is based on knockdown computers which are made available free by the way. There are 200 million such knockdown computers and already we have experience in five languages and five states and also in South Africa. Kohli told me, Mbeki's wife actually invited him and gave him a sample of 18 year old to 80 year old. He made them literate in 8 to 10 weeks and there is a very touching experience. An individual said, I used to go to church on a Sunday, stand there with a the Bible in my hand, pretending to read while others were reading, not understanding a word of it, now I understand what I am reading. That is the empowerment. Next. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? Government should launch a national mission. You know, we have this knowledge commission, this, that and the other. Actually, if at all there is a mission that we need to launch, it is this. We require active participation of NGOs. We need to scale it up to all villages. And there is a new public-private partnership and removal of illiteracy does become possible in five years. That is the power of technology that has been already sort of developed and proven not only within India but outside. And can we imagine a literate India, such an empowered India, what difference it will make? We will really have an enlightened democracy which is something we need to have. Let us look at other issues like healthcare. If you look at the challenge of new drug development, situation 10 years ago and situation now. 10 years ago the cost of development was 250 million dollars, today it is 1.5 billion dollars. Time taken previously was 10 years, now it is 15 years. But are we getting any smart? If you look at new chemical entities that are coming out from 40, they have dropped to 30. And at that rate, even the definition of rich and poor will have to be rewritten. Because even the rich in America will not be able to afford this drug. Next. Now, what is the problem? The problem I will illustrate to this particular example. In this drug development and discovery, and I am very happy Dr. Nityananda is here, Dr. C.M. Gupta is here, maybe some people from CDR and others are there. They are all in drug development. And they will tell you, what is happening is that we are using standard techniques today. Alright? And we are not using much imagination. Like what is being done here. What has happened? There is a car that had fallen here. Okay? And uh, a crane comes and tries to take it away. I mean, uh, lift it. Next. It has almost succeeded in lifting it and see what happens. The crane falls down. Okay? So what do you do when something like this happens? You say, I will take a bigger crane. Pump in more money, get a bigger crane. You take a bigger crane. Next. Here is the bigger crane. It is lifting it. Next. Almost succeeded. Next. <laughs> Pause down. So this just doesn't work. What are we trying to do? That is how drug development is going on today. We are looking at the same model. And therefore we need to look at alternative paths, doing things differently. On a lighter side, let me tell you something. When I was young, I was very fond of Hindi films. And that time, the setting used to be very similar. You know, you had a hero, a heroine, a villain, a comedian, 
you know, Viran Ken Singh and so on, comedian Go Paga and so on. And the last 15 minutes of the film were always the same. The heroine will be abducted by the villain. And what would he do? He would run away in, an, uh, in a uh, Mercedes. And while he was running away, the police will be chasing him. You know, in what? A Jeep. <laughs> so, here is this Mercedes, here is the Jeep, and the distance between the two kept on widening, like the developing world and the developed world distance. And yet, I remember going home happily. You know why? Because of the innovative hero. What would he do? He knew there is no way he can beat him by taking another car, by following the same path. He would take a horse. <laughs> and he would go on the hilltop and climb on the trees, this, that, and the other, the slide and land right in front of that Mercedes. <laughs> following a completely alternative path. And therefore, what we require is not just aping what the rest of the world is doing. Because if it is 1.5 billion dollar for developing a particular drug, it could be less in India. Doesn't matter, but our total budget is 6 billion dollars of the total R&D. For space, defense, atomic energy, CSR, IITs, everybody. We just can't do that. And therefore we must look at alternative path. Next. And therefore, again to remind you, innovation is doing different things and doing them differently. Next. So, what do we do in this case? Well, we can shift the location of R&D and manufacturing to what I like to call as IDCs, Innovative Developing Countries. And we have seen that. I mean, somebody like Shantabartek, when it comes and produces recombinant DNA vaccine for hepatitis B, the price was 700 rupees per dose. When they came in, it started falling by competition. From 700, today it is 18 rupees. All right? So Indian manufacturing has that capacity. Number two, use public institutions, capacity, like CDRI in IDCs in discovery and development. And sec last is of course, move from bitten path. Do something different. Next. And what is it that is doing differently? Well, we are very rich in traditional medicine. Can we create a golden triangle between traditional medicine, modern medicine and modern science? Next. What does it mean? That is what CSR is doing. Today we have launched a coordinated program by using our advantage in our natural resources, using modern science, Moving, using traditional knowledge to create a virtual organization through networking. Next. And you can see the kind of networking that we have been able to do by getting around our laboratories, getting around the universities, getting around our traditional knowledge systems like Arya Vidyashala and so on. Next. And the path that we are following is different. What was the conventional path? You discovered a molecule, put it into mice for regulatory toxicology, and then put it into men. All right? And chance of success was very small. But we are following what is called as the reverse pharmacology path. In the reverse pharmacology path, men have already used it. You put it in mice, put it into men, and see the difference. Next. I will just give you one example, the alternative path making difference. Psoriasis, which is currently in phase two, you find that if you look at drug in USA, the cost of development is several hundred million. In India, we will be able to finish this in around five million. Time for development, not 10 years, just three years. Cost of treatment, not $20,000. You know that Amgen has a $1,000 injection, antibody injection, and you require 20 of them. You will be able to do it in around $50 by following an alternative path. Next. And this is not the only one. There are a number of things that are coming through CSR innovations on hepatoprotective, hepatocurative, type 2 diabetes, and so on and so forth. And we are taking advantage of our, what you might like to call as a natural strength, natural advantage. When you talk about comparative advantage, you must look at what is our natural comparative advantage. Next. Let us uh, look at other issues, like for example, water. Next. And this investment, and Professor Rao talked about space, for example. They have done wonderful, I mean, if you look at the hydrogeological, morphological maps, geomorphological maps, the success rate of groundwater targeting has been raised considerably. So the high technology that you talk about, satellites, etc., are, uh, uh, is proving to be useful in finally helping water resourcing, water finding in uh, villages. Next. There are, for example, CSR has been developing these uh, 
technologies like this uh, RO unit which has been put in Mocha village. Next. This is uh, um, another one in Kisari village in Rajasthan. If you see this, this is in Kutch after earthquake. Our people had uh, uh, sort of gone there. Next. You find this is uh, 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 again in uh, Nirmudur, uh, uh, Ramnath Puram district and so on. But now one of the questions that you will ask me is that villages don't have uh, electricity. How will you operate these? Because if it is reverse osmosis, you require generation of 20 atmosphere pressure. Next. And this is where you can see Bharat on one side and Hindustan on, I mean, the, uh, the India on the other side. What they did was that when they went to Rajasthan, they used camels as a matter of fact to drive the RO process by using a gear system, low torque, high speed to high speed, uh, 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 low speed, high torque uh, to low torque, high speed and create that 20 atmosphere pressure that you want. Next. And this is in uh, Hasnabad, for example. Bullocks are being used here. Next. In fact, this got reviewed in New Scientist. Bullock operated reverse osmosis plant in action. And in fact, it said, device holds great promise for 1.2 billion people who lack electricity and clean water, but who have plenty of oxygen. Now, here is a good news as well as a bad news. The good news is, our uh, boys from CSM CRI, whose heart was in the right place, created this particular system so that water will be available to that village which had 300, 350 population of uh, families. But on the other hand, what they are saying is that 1.2 billion people who lack electricity and clean water, assuming that they will continue to lack electricity and clean water. Now, this is not something that is acceptable. I think we must move away from that. Next. High technology is critical. In fact, this is a breakthrough that uh, NCL had on precipitation polymerization process for the preparation of ultrafiltration membranes. This was a US patent that was granted. What it does is that it removes bacteria as well as virus. Easy to remove bacteria, very difficult to remove virus, but they were able to create pores of 20 nanometer or less. Next. And this is how the unit looks like. Next. Somebody gave us a big challenge. There's a, uh, b -b -b there's a newspaper reporter called Pallav Bagla. He's very demanding, very challenging. When he heard about this, he said, you come to Yamuna River and demonstrate to us. Yamuna River is the worst, by the way. You can demonstrate to us whether it will work or not. And you can see the difference that this has made. Next. And these are being put in villages now. Because again, you will say, there are no electricity. So there's a special hand pump operated unit that has been developed. It is remarkable. This is in Shivapur Khed. And it is rather remarkable. This hand pump operated unit gives you 3 liter per minute, by the way. And 3 liter is what you drink in a given day. So in one minute, you can create drinking water for one person. What has happened in these villages, we have been, I mean, this was put up there 8 or 9 months ago. The young children, their attendance has improved in the school. And what they also do is that they bring empty bottles and take this water home. So gradually, those villages around are getting sort of drinking water. Now there is a plan to expand this, by the way, across all schools and villages. Already Pune University has adopted all the colleges. The Prime Minister has desired that Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, all schools will have such units. And by the way, the price is just 4 paisa per litre for the water. We are trying to still sort of further reduce it. But there was a good technological innovation which made this possible. Next. Now, I come to another point. If you look at any product, performance and price, what we do is that high performance materials or products, services will be for rich, which will be priced highly, whereas low price will be always low performance. What we need to do next is to see as to how you can have low price but high performance. Now, let me tell you that technologically, the entire world is engaged in improving the performance, like this cell phone. I don't know how many functions it has. I use only a couple of them, by the way. But this can do everything. I mean, it can, I can just now take a video or uh, the photograph or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's miraculous what this can do. And bulk of the time, that is what we are busy at. But what we need to do is to see how we can create 
I mean, reduce prices, but create high performance, and that is also a great technological challenge. Next. If you just see how this challenge was made, let us say, in this Jaipur foot, this costs around $1,500, $1,500 to $2,000 abroad. This does not even cost $30, by the way. And look at its performance. It is able to do something which the, uh, b -b 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 you know, the artificial foot abroad is not able to do. Just look at this fellow. It is by look, uh, using ingenious methods, ingenious materials, ingenious way of doing it. And just watch, just watch what he did just now. He is able to run and design again for Indian conditions because our people scrat, people actually climb on trees, people stand on paddy fields, in paddy fields, people walk barefoot. And that's what I mean. By creating high performance, which is something somebody is not able to do abroad, but we are able to do it. Next. Just look at this. I'll explain to you. This is very close to my heart. You know, there are 4 billion people in the world whose income levels are less than $2 a day. 50% of them are women. Many of them will have menstruation cycles. Now, they need, they manage these menstruation cycles in a very unhygienic way. So you require those sanitary napkins. Now these are very expensive because they are based on super absorbing polymers. I worked in my life on super absorbing polymers so I know how costly they are. Now the issue is you need a performance where you need to absorb something like 300% fluid. Alright? Supposing now I give you the target that you have to absorb 300% like the Procter & Gamble sanitary napkin will do, but can you do it in one rupee? That is as good a technical challenge as any other. And Shriram Research Institute is able to do that. They have created this kind of low cost sanitary napkin. Next. And look at its comparison. The commercial one, which is produced by international company, 300% absorption, 300% absorption. Price, 4.5 rupees versus one rupee. This production is centralized and this is decentralized. It could be done in rural villages, basically. We need to sort of spread that. Can you see what difference it can make? And what did they do? The technological innovation was simple. They went just for rayon waste, which was available uh, 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 sort of free, did some very little clever chemistry in order to create that super absorption, and they have created this particular capacity. What difference can it make? Next. Nimitly, therefore, our New Millennium Indian Technology Leadership Initiative, when we created that, we set up this target. If you see, India had always operated in this region, where the market certainty were high and technology certainty were high. What do I mean? Markets were certain because we imported those products. We could see them. Technologies were certain because all that I had to do was to reverse engineer that product. From that, Nimitly, we said no. New Millennium Indian Technology Leadership Initiative will move in the upper quarter, where the market certainties will be low and technology certainties will be also low. Taking risks. Next. And I remember when we conceived this particular program, we created 10,000 pamphlets and we sent them across the country on 1st July 2000, giving the kind of challenges. That can you do that? Can we lead? Enough of following. Next. And I remember these were some of the challenges that were given and one of them was multifunctional PC within rupees 10,000. At that time, by the way, the price of PC was 70,000 and it was reasonable to give a challenge of rupees 10,000. Next. And today we have something like 37 projects, 240 partners. This is the biggest public-private partnership, by the way. 65 private and 175 public, 270 crores have been spent on that and what is coming out of it? Next. That challenge has been met by this device called Mobilis, which has been developed by Incor Software. Next. This was released on 10th May 2005. Next. And you can see what is happening. We are now creating a production of 3,000 units of three variants of Softcom. The Indian, there is a lot of interest in India now. ICTs, e for example, 
Airtel, Computec, and so on. And from Walmart, there have been inquiries. They are very deeply interested. There are so many others, and there are inquiries from Egypt, France, Germany, and South Africa. How much will it cost? If we make 50,000, price will be $200. But if we make, let's say, a million to two million, it will come down to $100. All right? And it can do everything that you want, excepting play video games or do high-end computing, which you don't need anyway. You can do uh, uh, sort of web browsing, internet, uh, uh, see a film, or uh, uh, do spreadsheet, word processing, whole range of things. And what difference uh, such a product uh, can make once you break that barrier. Next. And that is a dream that can come true. Next. Now, in this Nimitli program, for example, there has been a tuberculosis breakthrough again, a disease of the poor. You know, discovery of a new drug molecule, first in the last 40 years, by the way. The last one was 1963, rifampicin, a complete new chemical molecule. And most importantly, it reduces treatment duration from six months to two months in combination. The IND has been cleared and the clinical trials have been already started, as a matter of fact. Phase one clinical trials are on. You can see, once this particular challenge was given, how with a public-private partnership, one was able to create something like this. By the way, I had a discussion with Bill Gates when he came to Delhi about this. And he was so deeply interested because he said, this is precisely what I was looking for. The problem is that poor people, when they start a TB treatment, they stop it in two months. Because their appetite comes back, they regain weight, and so on and so forth. All the signs go away and uh, that is how you uh, develop disease resistance. And so people were looking for something like this, something which can shorten it, and India has been able to demonstrate that we can basically do it. This is making high technology work for the poor, poor in India. Next. Now what is the challenge? This is my final part. I think the real challenge is getting the best minds in the world to think and work on the problems of the poor. If we succeed in this, we would have succeeded. Next. Now, just last week, this has come in. MIT designed dollar 100 laptop for the world's poorest children. The best minds in the world, in MIT, are thinking about problems of the poor. Next. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has done something which I am really, really amazed about. What did they do? Don't look here, look at me. Okay? I'll explain to you what they've done and then I'll come to this. What they did was that, they set up a competition around the world. They picked up 14 grand challenges which need to be made to meet the needs of the poor. They received 1,500 entries. It was an open competition all around. They supported only 47 of them. $450 million were put in. And what did they do? For example, they looked at the problems of the poor. What did they do? Improving childhood vaccines. Creative, effective single dose vaccines that can be used soon after the birth. The reason is, the woman comes with her child, takes one shot, doesn't appear again. So can I accomplish in one shot what I would otherwise accomplish? Second, prepare vaccines that do not require refrigeration. Where do we have these uh, cold chains in our villages? Can we do that? Third, develop little free delivery systems for vaccines. Why? Because uh, you, you have problems in creating sterilization and therefore can you, for instance, create systems like nasal drops or a spray by which vaccines can be delivered. These were all big scientific challenges. Next. And who were the winners, by the way? The winners were Harvard, Caltech, Yale, Cambridge and Oxford and from the developing world, only Peking University in China. I ask why? Well, there could be two excuses. One is that we did not know about this initiative. Bad. Two, we knew about this initiative, we competed, but we could not win from India. That is worse. Why is it that we are not able to do this? Why should Harvard and Caltech should be working on our problems? And why we should not be working on them? I think that is the big challenge. Next. And making nanotechnology work for the poor, I have seen this report by this uh, Salamanca, uh, Biancello, uh, uh, and other people. And they talk in terms of the potentiality, in terms of energy storage, production, conservation, agriculture productivity enhancement, disease diagnostics, 
drug delivery, food processing and storage. Next. But I'm stunned by this particular comment that is written by Meridian Institute. It says nanotechnology promises new cancer treatment, cheaper and purer water. But the latest products offered to public were more air airtight balls, transparent sun black uh, lotion, and stain resistant trousers. This is not what poor people need. All right? They need something different. Next. And therefore, when I saw this, quantum dots for disease diagnostic, they may be used for cheap, efficient, handheld diagnostic devices available at point of care institutions in developing countries. It really touched my heart. Should we not be doing this? We should be doing this. Next. And therefore, our great challenge is getting the best minds in India to think and work on the problems of the poor. Next. This is happening. It is not that it is not happening. I mean, people like Ashok Junjunwala, whose heart is in the right place. We had our science advisory committee to the prime minister meeting chaired by Professor Siena Rao in IIT Chennai recently. And we have personally seen, as a matter of fact, how he is able to get connected to the villages. And that young man was driven by reduction of the last mile cost. He is now able to create village chaos with video conferencing. We are able to talk to the people in villages, etc. And it is making a lot of difference in terms of delivery of telemedicine. Issue is, can we have more Ashok Junjunwalas who worked for this problem? Next. And his technology, by the way, there is a CSR Diamond Jubilee Technology Award 2004 and we gave it to him because he meant something special for us. Because he was creating technologies which will make a difference to the poor. We need to acknowledge, we need to make heroes out of such people who are making that difference. Next. In fact, young children, what I find is that young children also get fascinated by the problem that they look around. You know, we, when CSR celebrated CSR Diamond Jubilee, we created a CSR Diamond Jubilee Innovation Awards for school children. We have massive response. We have awardees from class 6 to class 11, from Dahod to Delhi, Jaipur to Jabalpur, and Pratapgarh to Pune. Let me show you one next. This is a braille system, by the way. The normal braille system that you have, the dots are created on paper by pointed stylus from the reverse side with pits on the template. So writing is from uh, right to left and reading is from left to right. Now he has created this young man, next, next, next slide. This young man, Master Madhav, class 10, from Joy Higher Secondary School in Jabalpur, has created a system, go back please, a system where the dots are created on top side of a paper by a concave shaped stylus. So you get writing from left to right and reading also from left to right so that the blind doesn't have to remember 300 instructions. Next. So what are we doing? We are taking this innovation, we gave him the first prize. We are taking this forward, filing patterns for a uh, young partner. And one of my laboratories, CSIO, is designing and fabricating new generation braille. It is already being tested in school of the blind. What is the point I am trying to make? The point I am trying to make is that that young boy in Jabalpur is thinking of the prime problem of the blind and he is saying that I will create a solution and there are tens of millions of children in the school. Can we excite them about these problems? Next. I was really stunned when I made this Rishikesh Mendale, Rahul Purandekar and Chaitrali Amrutkar just last week, by the way, in my office. They had come. They are just third year computer engineering uh, students from Vishwakarma Institute of Technology. And what they have done is they have created textbook solutions for automated information exchange and query processing through Kias using mobile communication technology. Let me explain that to you. For example, you have uh, uh, this each of us where you have a personal computer all right, on which information is available and the farmers are benefiting. You know, hundreds of thousands of villages are now are having that and they get the right price information, etc. But the problem is that there is one PC in few square kilometer. Can, okay, how, how can a farmer be helped? But there are a number of more mobiles. All right? And therefore, can you empower a farmer by getting all that information from where he is on his mobile? Next. And that means a fellow like this, from where he is, rather than having to go uh, miles for that uh, PC. Next. And that is what they have done. They have created a special software, cell phone attached to the chaos computer. There is an automated query processing uh, through SMS and this is a beautiful discovery. And who has done it? Third year kids, so as to say. And what difference it can make 
to those villages, to those farmers. Next. And therefore, I'm going to say which, something which might look audacious. I say, why don't we create the equivalent of a Nobel Prize for a radical breakthrough which impacts lives of billions of poor? Second, why don't we have grand challenge problems for the poor on a nationwide basis by creating a competitive funding? And finally, why don't we create a global knowledge pool for global growth through global funding? Because today what has happened is that there is Bill Gates Foundation, there is Wellcome Trust, there are government donations and so on and so forth. They are going here and there. But if there are defined problems of the poor and technological solutions are basically needed, we should be able to create and operate such fund. Otherwise, million development goals will remain million development goals. They will not be achieved in millions of years. Next. There is a lot of expectation about India, as Professor Rao rightly said. In fact, just last year, there were four cover stories. New scientist had a cover story. Economist said, what is to stop India and China? Fortune talked about India and Business Week talked about China and India. Now, nowadays, by the way, they don't waste time by saying China and India. They say Chindia. Chindia is going to make a difference, basically. All right? This is all fine. But in order that this expectation is fulfilled, like what Professor Rao said, science for our future, that should not be forgotten. And when it comes to innovation, next, technological innovation, social innovation, and policy level innovation will have to go hand in hand. Both these, both this Professor Rao's appeal and this particular appeal will have to go hand in hand in order to fulfill that dream. Next. India is like this. This is my last. India is like a tip of the iceberg, a shining part. 50% children go to school. 30% of them go up to 10 standard. 40% pass. Multiply the three, you will find 6% of the children go beyond 10 standard. All right? So you are talking about the tip of the iceberg. When we talk about IT superpower, we talk about 600,000 professionals. It is 0.06% of Indian population. It is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. We are very fortunate that we are in this part of the iceberg, not the submerged one. All right? All of us here, we are very privileged few. The issue for India is that there is a submerged part of the iceberg. All right? And the people who reside there, if they are not going to think about that submerged part and connect, nothing is going to happen. And therefore, we have a Kohli who is making money in, for TCS, creating wealth, but at the same time he says, can I use it to make people literate so that their poverty will go and they will come to the shining part of the iceberg? These are Ashok Junjunwala who is bothered. There are those children from Vishmakarma Institute that are bothered. There is that young boy from Jabalpur who is bothered. I think that deep connectivity we need to create. If that happens, then it's not just the tip of the iceberg that will shine. Entire India will shine. And that should be our dream. Thank you very much.